Um, so we're in the process of handing back the midterm, so now you're going to be receptive to hearing what I've said before, but you often forget that people are talking, so they won't hear it, and they'll say, oh my god. So um, if you have in your head this notion that 90 to 100 is an A and 80 to 90 is a B, that's a notion you need to get out of your head. Okay, so there is no strict correspondence between letter grades and numbers. Um, there is some correspondence, but it's not whatever you learned in high school. So if you have that old 90 to 100 thing in your head, get rid of it. Um, I don't know, because I haven't sat down and played with a spreadsheet yet to figure out what the correspondence is between A's and B's and C's. Um, uh, this class, usually the median winds up being about a B. Maybe it's maybe on a, yeah, basically a B. So, um, and I think the median's around 70. Is that right? Yeah, so. Um, and um, remember that I always reward improvement. So if you do better on the next two exams relative to this exam, then we weight the later exams more heavily. Remember also that there's a whole lot of ways to earn points in this class. But that midterm was only 20% of the total. Um, you've got response papers, you've got problem sets, there's five points extra credit on the problem set that you can add on to your midterm one score. Uh, you've got the term paper. So there's a whole lot of different things going on in, in ways in which to earn credit. Um, this is one of the reasons I wanted you to do the study skills exercise in section, to talk about what were the study skills you used and the study strategies you used and what did other people use and what tips you might gather from other folks and how you might amend your approach. For those of you who are used to 100 800 B type stuff, we got a lot of words in this class, right? This is not simply a model. Um, so there's a lot of information and it's using a different part of your brain than the 100 800 B kind of material. Um, so you'll get the hang of it. Yeah. The question is, when do I update grades on B-Space? B-Space hates me. Um, and I'm really pleased to know that B-Space is going to die sometime in the next year and they're replacing it with a whole new system. So yeah, it's like, I <laughs> Like my personal campaign against B-Space over the last 10 years. Um, so uh, I, not until next week. I need to wait until I get all, all spreadsheets from all three GSIs, and then I have to pray that I can merge those spreadsheets and that I can get B-Space to accept them. It usually takes me like three hours of fighting with B-Space to upload grades. Yeah, but you guys are uploading things to your own sites or no? Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly, that's why, yeah, there's, there's economies of scale and having just me do it because it's such a pain in the ass process. So, but it won't be until next week. Other questions? Okay, uh, oh yeah. So on the first problem set on the back, the last question is a five point extra credit question. So if you do that question and get the extra credit, we'll add that onto your midterm one score. So I made it that way because you may remember that the total number of points that you can get for the non-exam stuff is capped. Um, and so I didn't want this to just put you closer to the cap. I wanted to allow people to go over that cap. So the five points are not added onto your problem set scores, they're added onto your midterm score. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yes, so the guy was here, and um, as far as I know, the class is still supposed to be webcast, well, screencast, whatever they call it. Um, so the guy was here, and they checked the equipment and said the equipment is now working, so the slide should be, once again, at webcast.berkeley.edu. So, other questions? On Thursday, Professor Such will be here. He's going to guest lecture for me. I'm heading out tonight to the East to do a series of seminars on work that I've been doing. Um, he's going to do the material on immigration. I've posted his slides already um, to the website. It's, uh, it is material that you're responsible for. There are some tables that have to do with immigration that are on today's handout. I don't know that he's going to necessarily incorporate those tables. He likes to do a lot of graphs. Um, I guess he's more visual than I am. So he does things in graphs, and I like to see things in numbers. So I give you tables, and he has lots and lots of graphs. So his slides are already on our website. His lecture will not be screencast. So Thursday's lecture will not be screencast. Um, just a different tech. He wasn't comfortable with the technology, so there you go. Um, uh, what else did I want to say about Richard being here? Um, hmm? Read the article for Thursday. Yeah, so the article in the reader for Thursday is the article he wrote. So you want to make sure that you look at that um, so that you can ask him good questions and so he can say, wow, you have really good students. Um, he uh, is also a distinguished teaching award recipient from UC Berkeley. The first time I TA'd economic history, which was a long time ago, I was a TA for him. Um, in, I think in 155 Twinell. Um, and uh, so this very class. Yep, yep. So um, there you go. All right, any other questions before we dive in? Cool. We ended on Thursday looking at the map, maps from David Wheelock's article. Wheelock's article is looking at bank failures. And the question that we like is addressing in his article is really an asymmetric information question. It's about whether or not the provision of deposit insurance makes banks take, take riskier positions. So the idea is this. If there is deposit insurance, that means that if you put your money into a bank and that bank fails, then you can go to the insurance uh, company. In the case today, it's the federal government, but at the time it was not. You can go to the insurance company and say, hey, I had $1,000 in this bank. This bank failed. I want my $1,000 back, and the insurance will give you back your deposit. The concern is that once banks have deposit insurance, so they know that their depositors will not lose money if the bank itself happens to fail, the question is whether or not this encourages banks to take on riskier behaviors than they would in the absence of insurance. So it's a classic asymmetric information problem, and here we're looking at moral hazard. So we're looking at does the bank change its behavior in response to having the insurance. And the idea is that the bank that has deposit insurance may make riskier loans, that is, loans that have a higher risk of default on them, that the, the borrower won't pay back, uh, because the bank knows that its depositors won't be hurt. The contrast would be a world in which there is no deposit insurance. In a world without deposit insurance, then the burden falls on the depositors, the customers, you and I, to keep track of the bank and what the bank is doing. So if you have your checking account at Bank of America in the absence of deposit insurance, you have an incentive to keep track of what's in Bank of America's loan portfolio. And you see Bank of America by countrywide, you think, ooh, this is not a good idea, and you might withdraw your funds from Bank of America. So in the absence of deposit insurance, the depositors, that is the customers who are putting their money in the bank, have an incentive to monitor the bank and provide the the monitoring, I don't know another word for the monitoring that prevents the bank from taking on excessively risky behavior. But with deposit insurance, there is no monitoring function on the part of the customers. So the question is, do banks that have deposit insurance, do they make riskier loans, and do they therefore fail more? So what Wheelock is going to do is he's going to exploit county by county variation in the likelihood of bank failures and in the existence of insurance. In the 1920s in Kansas, that's a map of Kansas, in the 1920s in Kansas, the deposit insurance was a state-provided uh, product. So there was no federal deposit insurance corporation that hasn't come to the New Deal of the 1930s. At this time, there are some states that have a state-level deposit program, uh, and Kansas is one of those states. It's optional. Banks are not required to take out a deposit insurance policy. They have the option of doing so, but they're not required to do so. 
So he's got some variation in the share of banks that fail. He's got some variation in the share of banks that are insured. He's got some variation that we saw the other day in uh, what happens to farm values over the time period he's looking at, which is the 1920s, and in what happens to the amount of acreage. So we look at the maps of the day. The maps give you a eh, hunch, sort of, kind of, as to what might be going on. But it's really with econometric work that we're able to tease out how these different factors contribute to the likelihood of a bank failing. He's got two measures of failure for banks. One is a strict measure. That's columns one and three, and that's the banks that failed. This table was at the end of the handout from last week. Um, uh, the strict measure is banks that actually fail. The weaker measure, which is columns two and four, are banks that either fail or choose to liquidate. So you can be, if you're a bank, and, and all of a sudden a bunch of your loans have gone bad, you can wait and just sort of wait it out until you actually go completely bankrupt and can't pay back your depositors, in which case you failed. Or you can see the writing on the wall, realize that, uh-oh, this is not going to end well, and you can choose to liquidate the bank, that is, sell off the bank's assets, before you actually reach the point of failure. So, so the idea is that, that we don't necessarily want to look at just those banks that hold on until the dire end and, and, uh, and are forced through the failure process. We want those that recognize that's where they're going and take some proactive action, so columns two and four. Um, and then the, the various variables that are here along the left column are showing you the things that he tries to control for. And again, this is county by county analysis. So uh, the first, the change in value is how much, uh, what's the change in the value of the farmland and the buildings? Change in land, how much, how much acreage, that is cultivated acreage, what's the change in that by county? Ratio, what's the percentage of the banks in that state, in that county that have insurance? And that's the key variable that we want to look at because that's really the one that tests whether or not insured banks are more likely to fail. Uh, the change in population is a proxy for a change in economic activity because there's no direct measure of economic activity. So he proxies that with a change in population, uh, the number of banks per person and the percentage of the banks that were national banks. Remember that state banks could make real estate loans, national banks could not. One of the concerns in doing this analysis is that what if the issue is that banks that are making loans in farmland recognize that those farm loans are more likely to go bad and therefore they choose the insurance. So what if it's not that the insured banks make riskier loans because they're insured, a moral hazard problem. But what if there's a selection bias here where the banks that are more likely to fail because of where they're located and the types of loans they're able to make given the environment they exist in, what if the banks that recognize ex ante they're more likely to fail are the ones that buy insurance? Then having a correlation between insured banks and failure is not telling us that there's a moral hazard problem. So that's why we need to control for the factors that determine the likelihood of a bank's failure. That's why the change in the value of land is in there. That's why that proxy for the change in the economic activity is in there, because those things should be giving us, essentially taking away the influence of this is a county in which banks were more likely to fail because this is a county in which farms were failing. So once we've controlled for the various factors that could make a bank fail, is there anything left over for the role of insurance, Sam? What's the incentive for a bank to get deposit insurance? If there are competing banks in a community, um, the bank with deposit insurance is likely to have more depositors than the bank without deposit insurance. Therefore, it's able to make more loans. Therefore, it's able to make more profit. So the, the having the insurance um, is going to allow them ultimately to have a more profitable venture because they can attract more customers. Yes, they have to pay a premium. There's an insurance premium that they have to pay. Yeah. Okay, so controlling for these other factors, what does he get? Um, if we look at all banks, so this includes counties that have uh, only one bank as well as counties that have 20 or 30 banks, then the existence of insurance is seems to indicate a higher level of failure. So we have 0.13, we've got a couple of stars there. I don't remember what, what the, I'm sure the two stars is a 5% cutoff because we've got one, two, and three stars, two is a pretty good star. Um, however, if we have the broader measure, so we include not just those that go all the way to the failure process, but those that also see the writing on the wall and choose to liquidate, then no longer do we have any statistical significance for the role of insurance. If we restrict the sample and look only at counties with five or more banks, then we're able to get at the kind of argument that Sam was just alluding to when she asked, why would you get insurance? Because if there are five or more banks in the county, then there is some competition between the banks for the customers in that county, and then buying insurance is a way of trying to woo customers to that bank. On the other hand, the first two columns include all banks. That means it includes the banks in the counties where there's only the one bank. And so it's not really clear why they would have insurance in the first place because they're not using it as a way of moving customers away from the other uh, neighboring banks. So we're going to focus on the third and the fourth columns, the ones with the counties with five or more banks. And then you see that whether we're looking at banks that fail or banks that either fail or choose to liquidate, that is columns three or four, in both cases there's a statistically significant effect of insurance. Since this is controlling for the factors that would lead to greater uh, loan defaults, the takeaway from this is that the evidence does seem to indicate that controlling for economic factors that would trigger higher bank failures, that higher that the likelihood of having insurance increases the likelihood of failure. So banks that take on insurance are more likely to fail, controlling for economic conditions. It's evidence in support of the moral hazard argument that banks take on riskier, riskier portfolios, that they make riskier loans uh, when they have insurance. This is the kind of argument that was used in the 1990s to argue against having federal deposit insurance. Now, we still have it. That's a good thing. But there were a group of economists who were putting together arguments 20 years ago to argue that federal deposit insurance was one of the things that was giving us at that time the, the banking crisis of the 1990s. And there are others who will argue that deposit insurance also contributes to the banking crisis of 2007, 2008. Uh, and this is the kind of evidence that is in support of that argument, that insured banks uh, exhibit moral hazard and take on riskier portfolios. And so the insurance is part of the problem leading to the bank failures. Questions? Yep. The significance? Uh, columns three and four versus one and two. Right. So uh, the, it leads actually back to the question that Sam asked about why would a bank take on it? Why would a bank buy insurance? So banks buy deposit insurance because they want to um, get more customers. They want to have more people who put their money in the bank as depositors. If there's only one bank in the county, and in the 1920s, travel is pretty difficult. This is farmland. The roads are not paved by and large. So counties are pretty much the, the extent of how far you're going to go to put your money someplace. If there's only one bank in your, and so we're not really looking at differences in behavior within county. So if we restrict the sample to just the counties that had five or more banks, then first off we've got, a, um, well not first off, then we have uh, a situation in which the counties within the bank are making this choice about insuring themselves against failure as a way of moving depositors to the bank. Does that help? Okay. Other questions? Sam? Um, so in terms of explaining why this number winds up not statistically significant, um, I lost the thread of what you said, but I think, that, can you say it again? Right. Except that if the issue was that the banks who, so, so let me see if I say this right, okay. So if the, 
if we look at the counties with four, three, two, or one banks, where they don't have the sort of competition issues going on, and they do take on insurance, perhaps they're taking on insurance with the intention of extending riskier loans, right? And if that extending riskier loans then leads to greater bank failure, that's a link that we, that's an assumption, right? If the taking on riskier loans leads to greater bank failure, then that 0.01 there would be statistically significant. Because then the, the banks with insurance would be more likely to fail, even in the counties with four, three, two, or one banks. So it would work. So, so your argument, I understand your argument, but I think your argument doesn't help to explain why that 0.01 is not statistically significant. Because 0.01 says that once we have the, the counties with only one bank in there, we lose any relationship between insurance and failure. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Okay. New subject. We got that. We got three subjects today. Totally different subjects. New subject. So we've got a whole bunch of pieces that combine so far to underscore a changing business environment in the United States by the end of the 19th, early 20th century. Uh, the labor force that's in agriculture has been declining, um, and we've gone from 53% of the labor force in ag in, in 1870 to 31% of the labor force is in agriculture in 1910. So by 1910, the early part of the 20th century, we have less than one-third of our labor force is in ag. We're no longer predominantly an agricultural nation. We also are an increasingly urban population. So this is table one from today's handout. Uh, in 1860, only 20% of the United States population lived in urban areas. By 1910, 46% of the population lived in urban areas. Today, it's 81%. So we're not overwhelmingly urban, but we're certainly a much more urban country in 1900 and 1910 than we had been uh, on the eve of the Civil War. Real incomes have been rising over the last quarter of the 19th century. Uh, industrial incomes were rising on average 1.7% per year. Non-farm incomes, 1.5%. GNP was rising 3.1%. So we have uh, strong growth in income on average over this period, 1875 to 1900. So we have a, a less agricultural, more urban, richer society. Um, the amount of hours that people were putting into work was going down, and the amount of leisure time that people had was going up. And so we have a population that is trying to find ways, uh, basically, to purchase recreation. So we have increases in the late 19th and the early 20th century. We have increases in expenditures for recreation. So um, things like bicycles, or balls, or books, or once we get to cars, and of course we have the whole introduction of auto vacations. So various ways of, of financing, of purchasing things that support recreation, because there was more leisure time, because the number of hours that people worked were declining over time. There's evidence, and Professor Satch will speak to this on Thursday, that immigrants were trying to assimilate through their spending patterns, that the types of goods, including home ownership, which is the focus of the article Professor Such wrote, which we want you to read for Thursday, that the types of goods that immigrants in the late 19th century were purchasing were not the kinds of goods they would have bought in the old country at home, but they were the kinds of goods that Americans bought. And so people were trying to, to assimilate into American society through buying the same things that, quote, Americans, unquote, uh, were purchasing. At the same time, we have big business producing a lot of these consumer goods, and big business has very high fixed costs. So we talked about industrialization. I skipped over the merger movement because I have to make choices in terms of what we cover. But we have increasing number of, of uh, large, relatively large companies, and these, these production, these, excuse me, these manufacturing companies have relatively high fixed costs. We saw some of the pictures associated with those high fixed costs of machinery uh, previously. And the, the demand on the one hand and the high fixed costs on the other hand bring together forces that encourage mass production, that encourage businesses to produce not one item for Nick and another item for Sarah, but to produce thousands and thousands of items, and who knows who will buy them. And we've got periodic business cycles. Now, some of these business cycles were begun with the bursting of bubbles related to the financing of the railroad industry. It doesn't really matter what started the cycles. The fact is that there were these periodic business cycles where production would go down. So business cycles similar to what we have today, however, in an environment in which a larger share of the labor force and the economy is agricultural. So 1870, where was my numbers? I have to put my glasses back on. Um, 1870, we've got 53% of the labor force is still in agriculture. So this business cycle is affecting the other 47% of the labor force. By the 1890s, uh, we've got another 10% of the population is in the non-farm labor force. And so a larger share of the population is being affected directly by these business cycles. But we have these periodic business cycles. And the downturn of the 1890s was really bad. Um, it's hard to put numbers on things back that far. We didn't have a Bureau of Economic Analysis gathering data. People are trying to backcast these things from a variety of evidence. But it appears that the 1890s downturn was on a par with the Great Depression. It ended faster. And it didn't apply to as large of a share of the population because we still had about 40% uh, of the population was working the farm. Uh, but it was really big in terms of the unemployment rates in, in the 1890s. So all of this changing business environment leads to efforts on the part of businesses to pay more attention to the marketing of their products. Businesses are getting larger. They're subject, to, however, to the whims of these business cycles. And so they're experiencing periodic failures. And they want to find ways to essentially insulate themselves from failure. And so I want to talk a little bit about marketing um, and a little bit about distribution as, and think about it in this context of efforts in a very different economy at the end of the 19th, early 20th century and efforts to try to stave off business failure that was associated with these periodic cycles that the economy went through. Um, the first piece is installment selling. There's a lot more about installment selling that we'll talk about next Tuesday when we talk about consumer installment credit and some work that I've done on racial differences in the use of installment credit and extension of installment credit in the first part of the 20th century. But briefly, uh, installment selling is when you are going to buy a particular durable good. So it might be today, it might be a car. Uh, at the time, it might have been a piece of furniture. It might have been a piano. Uh, it might have been a harvester, for that matter, on the farm. You're going to buy a particular durable good, and you're not going to pay for it all at once. You're going to provide a down payment. The down payments are relatively large. So today, you can go to a car dealership, and you can get a car, and you're going to pay for it over seven years, and maybe you have to put $100 down, and, and sometimes with these super sales, you don't have to put anything down. In that late 19th, early 20th century, you're talking 25 to 33% down. So these are substantially large down payments. So one quarter to one third of the purchase price as a down payment. And then you sign it. The buyer signs a contract, and the contract specifies that the buyer will make regular periodic payments. Those pay payments may be uh, monthly, they may be quarterly. If you're buying a harvester, they may be annually. So uh, if you're buying a piece of, of agricultural machinery, the periodic payments are when the harvest comes in um, and, and not on a monthly basis. If you're buying a piano, you're making monthly payments. So there's periodic monthly payments. You have these monthly payments that are on a specified schedule that's in the contract that you signed to begin with. It's very much like buying a car today. Uh, and when that's done, then you've completed the installment contract. You own the good now free and clear, uh, and the relationship with the finance company or the financer is, is over. Um, on and Tuesday, and also when we talk about the Great Depression, I'm going to talk more about what happens if people miss payments and the default consequences. I don't want to go into that today. So that's material I'm going to hold off for next week and also during the Great Depression because installment selling is an important part of understanding both the 20s and the 30s in the United States. Installment selling um, starts with singer sewing machines. So